Hey, good evening, everybody. I am Paul Servatka, and I am the Vice President of the Chicago AMS, and this is a joint meeting with the Chicago AMS and the College of DuPage AMS group, and then... And NIU, I think, and right? NIU There's game. some NIU folks. How many so. NIU, we got some NIU folks there. This is awesome. Um, How many of you are students? Just raise your hand. Okay. Students Pro across the board. Uh, professionals in the field or past professionals? Okay. Excellent. Or how many of you are lonely academic professors? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, okay. I'm lonely right. and lonely. It's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, we've been trying to get this thing all set up now for the the winter season, and winter's kind of gotten in the way. We've been we were just talking about the winter. Um, those of you who have been around the block a few years, can you remember a winter that was this tough? What is the, didn't uh, one of your friends do the pain in the misery index for winter? Yeah. This has got to be ridiculous. Severe weather uh, impacts a whizzy index. It was like it's how, how severe the winter has been. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we're up there pretty high on that. I, yeah. Since 85, this is, is bad? It probably is because November was horrible. And I, I noticed a lot of people were just kind of walking around going, oh, it's not so bad. It's just Chicago winter. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This is November. Then December was like easy, and then we hit the toilet in January and February, and it's going to be brutal. Yep, so. for those that were watching, we have preliminarily set the Illinois all-time record low temperature at Mount Carroll at minus 38 Fahrenheit at a co-op station. That will be verified probably in the next couple of weeks, and then it will go down in the record books as all-time, surpassing Congerville at minus 36 Fahrenheit in 99, I believe, January. So. So stupid, so stupid cold. we've been suffering through winter, so we're going to do a lot of fun things today. We've got some hurricane stuff. Uh, just to give you some idea of the upcoming meetings uh, and some an announcements, on March 13th, four weeks from today, uh, Marty Isis, who is a United Airlines dispatcher, works downtown at Sears, is going to be talking. Uh, and he'll be talking about how weather influences the flight planning. Uh, I think that should be kind of interesting because we all kind of know how flights behave, and he'll be talking about how weather's really kind of bringing that in. So I know there's a lot of aviation students who are going to be coming to that. That'll be great. And then I'm very excited about a gentleman named Jason Levitt, who will be here April 3rd. Jason was one of the first chasers we ever had here in the COD program back in like 1990. And he was a 16-year-old at that time. And he's a little bit older now, but he's moved up to the Environmental Modeling Center, the EMC. And he'll be coming in to talk about the future of numerical modeling from the National Weather Service and how that's going to be. Uh, with the GFS FV3, the government shutdown has delayed that, but it's supposed to come online sometime in the next approximately month. The FV3 will be take over the GFS, and that will be our only long-range model. But the GFS FV3 will be the model that will work its way down the scales, so it'll take over the NAM, and it'll also take over the HER a couple of years down the line. So it will be the entire modeling suite all in this model. So Jason will become explaining this, and it's he's, this is kind of a big deal. So we're going to really push that NIU, Valpo, National Weather Service, whatever we can get, this is going to be a really important talk. Um, any announcements from any of the local groups? NIU, do you have any announcements from your group or COD? What do we got? Anything? Sure. Here's Mike. All right. Um, anyone that's interested, we have um, COD meteorology sweatshirts and um, also long sleeves. The sweatshirts are $40, and the uh, long sleeves are $25. Um, I have flyers, and you can order them online. The website's on here, and it can be shipped directly to your house. And then we still have calendars for sale, and now they're half off, and they're $5, if anyone's interested. Because we're almost, like, it's a pretty good deal, because we're only two months into the year. It's half off. That's a pretty good price. <laughs> you too much off the half. Do not, we have any? Not June yet. Uh, Chicago AMS stuff. How are we doing with membership? Do you want to say anything about the membership? 18, 19 members. So if you are a, a working person from the Chicago AMS, we'd love to have you join. 
Uh, we've been doing pretty well financially, but we are going to be having some more costs as we go forward, so we could use that. I know CAD, AMS, you can become a member here at $15. That would be great to have that. Um, one other thing I want to make an announcement of is the COD storm chasing program will be, uh, we are in sign up mode and we are kind of needing people this year. It's a little bit down from years past. We'll have a new van, we'll have four trips. We're hoping to get some people to sign up. If you're NIU students, this goes for your graduation. We are going to have the storm chase. We also have a two hour severe weather analysis that you can take kind of together and that will meet your three-hour course that so we should be able to do that. We're going to be some, doing some changes in the future for, for NIU students particularly. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me about storm chasing. Uh, you want to just mention the banquet potential? We, yeah, we've also got a potential banquet. We are looking at the dates of that. We're not going to announce the speaker yet, but we are looking at the dates. We have sort of a problem with the storm chasing season and Easter being really late. So we're thinking about maybe pushing this off to June sometime and maybe do a later banquet, so it'll be something more for the summer, but we're hoping to get a really amazing person, and you'll all want to come to that, so. Anything else that we need to do for club membership? I think we're going to be going out afterward to Granite City today, so if anybody wants to come out and meet with some of the speakers and just have some fellowship and talk about uh, weather stuff, we're going to be going to Granite City, which is out, where is that, in Warrenville, or? I think that's Naperville. Naperville, Warrenville, that area, so along I-88. So we'll go there afterward, and all are welcome to come. And I will let... 1119 has to go back to the classroom. And Dave's 1119 class will go back to the classroom and ask him to let you out what 10 minutes Debbie early Downer. and come to Granite City. Man, so. not letting him out. All right, well, I have the pleasure this evening to uh, introduce our formal speaker, uh, Katie Ertel. Uh, and you can see from her slide in the upper right the... Important FEMA logos scares me whenever I see that there's a disaster pending. So uh, Katie is a meteorologist and GIS specialist with FEMA, uh, Region 4 in Atlanta. She's provided analysis, planning, and expertise for over 14 federal disasters. There are so many to list that I can't even go through them all, but uh, a, a pretty impressive CV. She's worked on geospatial information expertise and provides meteorological analysis to teams including the watch unit, National Hurricane Program, Hurricane Liaison Team, the New Madrid Seismic Zone Catastrophic Planning Team, and has also been a GIS manager in the field. Uh, Katie earned her BS in meteorology with a minor of geography from Valpo, and I'm going to let her take it away talking about meteorology and emergency management and really the intersection of what I think is a really important aspect of our field that's sometimes overlooked. So Katie, please take it away. All right, thank you for inviting me to speak here. Uh, COD is really special to me. I've been storm chasing with COD since I was 18 years old, so this summer will be my 11th storm chase, for those of you uh, keeping count. Um, but like Victor said, I wanted to talk today about how meteorology um, has a very significant place in the emergency management world. Um, as he said, I went to Valparaiso University. I got an undergrad in meteorology. But then I went on to University of South Carolina to study specifically GIS and meteorology. And that's where I fell into the emergency management world. Uh, they have a hazards and vulnerability institute. Um, and I took several emergency management classes there uh, and had the opportunity to interface with um, a lot of their EM professors there. Um, so I'm going to start with a video. Um, this is going to explain way better than I ever could what an emergency manager does, because I think this is something that a lot of people uh, don't really understand, their role in disaster response. Not all disasters are alike. They can be viewed on a spectrum, from the simplest accident to a major disaster. Most of these emergencies don't need to be managed. They're handled by police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and other responders as routine matters. So what happens when really bad emergencies need more capability than the individual agencies can provide? That's where emergency managers come in to coordinate all the agencies. And the bigger the scope of the incident, the more an emergency manager's value increases. Let's show this with a worst case example. The largest of all disasters in terms of scale, complexity, and consequences is a nuclear strike. This is the mother of all disasters. Imagine some bad guys get a hold of 140 pounds of highly enriched uranium and figure out how to cobble together a working bomb, an improvised nuclear device. 
They get it into place and set it off. The result is confusion, fear, and chaos. Think of our society as a complex Rubik's Cube, interdependent systems that have developed over time to sustain our way of life. A nuclear attack severs our connections to the rest of society. Fear and anxiety would take over as the rhythm of our daily life is destroyed. So if that's the emergency, when does the management come in? Management is what emergency managers do to create order from that chaos. Our job is to squeeze the timeline so we bring back order faster. The hard part is how. So let's take a look at the way emergency managers work. First, we get a few emergency managers together in the field or in a room and start working. We find the facts and tell the story. We tell who is in charge, what's happening, is it getting worse or getting better, and what are we doing and what needs to be done. We start to re-establish the connection severed by the blast. In the Emergency Operations Center, we begin to connect people and organizations to the city and to each other. We tell them to connect inside and outside their own organizations with the same message. This is what is happening, and what do you see to inform this picture? By doing this, we're creating a new organization, one that didn't exist before and will never exist again. Imagine this incident organization as a pyramid with three distinct levels. At the top is the strategic level, with agency executives, local, state, federal, and elected officials, where political objectives are translated into strategy. At the bottom of the pyramid is the biggest and most important level, the tactical level, or the people who we call the boots on the ground. And in the middle is where strategy is translated into effective action, where what we need to get done becomes the how we'll do it. We call this the operational level, and this is where the emergency managers sit. Their job is to support everybody, and they do it by managing information, telling everybody everything, managing resources, getting the right stuff to the right place at the right time, and managing consequences, finding and solving problems. But even if you were doing all that, you're still not done. You must tell everyone everything that you're doing all the time. It's critical for the leadership to know the facts so they can convey it to the public. This connection creates trust with the impacted population, and without it, credibility is lost and our work won't matter. Some experts in government and academia believe that disaster response consists of leadership and the field, and that there's no need for the emergency managers. But the fact is, emergency managers create the incident organization that can manage the catastrophe. Only then can we turn our corner fast enough where order is not yet restored, but the sense of order is palpable. The problem is that during a catastrophe, the only thing that doesn't grow quickly enough is the number of emergency managers at the operations level. We simply can't get big enough fast enough. Keep in your mind this image of a catastrophic incident versus a tiny brake pad. Is this going to be able to manage this job? We have to be able to build this brake pad really big enough fast enough so we can create this incident organization and use it as the initiating mechanism for order, the starting point back to that Rubik's Cube of complexity. So a little bit of a pitch for emergency management as well in there at the end. Um, but I hope that gives a better picture of what emergency managers do uh, from the base level. But as you saw in that video, um, there are many different levels of emergency management throughout the government, uh, city emergency managers, county emergency managers, state emergency managers, and then federal emergency managers, which is where FEMA um, comes into play. And all of these emergency managers are responsible for the organization and management of resources and responsibilities in their respective jurisdictions. Um, so during blue sky days and during disaster days. Um, typically emergency management is looked at in four different phases, uh, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So at the local level, you could be responsible for all of those phases if you're just one person at the county level. Uh, once you get to the state and federal level, we have different divisions and usually devote uh, several people to, to each phase of emergency management. Uh, emergency management involves plan structures and relationships um, that need to be established prior to a disaster in order uh, to have a hope of restoring normalcy after a disaster. 
Um, there are several ways to get into emergency management. Like I said to you, I, I went to a graduate program for it, but now a lot of undergraduate um, and universities have emergency management uh, programs as well. I know Valpo has an emergency management club now. So what is FEMA? For those of you who don't know what FEMA stands for, it's the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It can be traced back to 1803, uh, where they responded to a fire in New Hampshire in 1802. Uh, in 1979, Jimmy Carter signed an executive order that created FEMA. It wasn't until uh, 2003 when the Federal Emergency Management Agency became part of the Department of Homeland Security following 9-11. And in 2006, George Bush uh, signed another law, the Post-Katrina Emergency Reform Act, after um, FEMA's response to Hurricane Katrina that really sent our agency through a reorganization um, period of time and came out of that with a more robust preparedness mission for FEMA. So here's our mission statement. This slide uh, became old as of today. Um, that first mission that you saw was Craig Fugate. He was the first appointed administrator uh, after uh, Katrina, and he served until uh, 2017. But today, Brock Long resigned as the administrator of FEMA. So um, that was his mission statement down at the bottom. Um, and that's kind of a sore subject. Brock was a Region 4 FEMA hurricane program manager. And he was very fit as an administrator for our uh, agency. So we'll see where this takes us. Uh, just a few graphics to start out. So keep in mind, this is just 2017 and 2018. I've been with FEMA for four years, and the last four years, particularly in the southeast, have been very, very busy in terms of disasters. Uh, so 2017, 2018, obviously you see the big hurricanes here, um, but we've also had record flooding in South Carolina, um, several severe weather and tornado disasters across Mississippi and Alabama, um, and fires in the Tennessee area that we have responded to as well. So as I said before, I'm part of FEMA Region 4. Uh, FEMA has 10 different regions across the country. Region 4's office is in Atlanta, Georgia. It encompasses the eight southeastern states, um, all the way up to Kentucky, over to North Carolina, down to Florida, and um, as far west as Mississippi. Chicago is home to Region 5's office, um, which, as you can see here, covers Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, so much of the Midwest here. Um, so, but I'm going to talk about why Region 4 is unique. Besides my opinion that we're the best region, I, <laughs> I think that uh, or 75 percent of all tropical cyclones that make landfall in the states uh, impact Region 4. So we're always on our toes, especially the last couple of years. So 75 percent of tropical cyclones make landfall in Region 4. Um, that's 39 percent of the U.S. population that lives in coastal areas, which is 446 people per square mile. Um, so with more and more people wanting to live near the coast, because it's really pretty, why wouldn't you want to live near water? Um, that makes us uh, change our approach um, in, in thinking about how these people might require life-saving and recovery assistance, um, not only from FEMA, but from a state approach and from a city approach as well. Um, and then a little shameless plug to Victor's research recently. Um, we're, just, we're getting more and more tornadoes um, as trends are showing. So we have to be on our feet about that as well. Um, our season actually just started. I was telling some people it was 70 degrees in Atlanta yesterday, and we had a tornado warning. So um, we're in spring, although it's not quite spring here. Um, so a little bit about my role at FEMA and what I do for FEMA. So this is an, an AMS talk, and I am a meteorologist. However, my position title at FEMA is a GIS specialist. Uh, so those of you who are not familiar with GIS, stands for Geographic Information Science or Systems, depending on how you look at it. And to put it simply, um, I make maps for FEMA. I'm in charge of making a lot of maps that have a lot of data behind them for FEMA. Um, I fall under the response division in FEMA, and more specifically, under the operational planning branch. Um, so these are a few of our goals as a GIS team. We're very fortunate we have eight members in our GIS team, which allows us to split into an operational team and a development team. So we have people who are working specifically on operational products and other people who are uh, using Python to automate processes and make tools that speed up our operational processes as well. So we have a good variety of people that we work with in Region 4. Uh, one of the most important parts of my job is establishing relationships with our other federal partners and state partners before disasters. So this involves meeting regularly with our states, um, 
all eight of our states have really great GIS managers embedded in their emergency management um, agencies at the state as well. And then we also interact with other federal partners, um, NOAA obviously a lot. Uh, we have a very good relationship with the National Hurricane Center. We have two liaisons that sit down there full time. Uh, we have a liaison at SPC that sits there full time as well. Uh, we interact with USGS a lot. They do a lot of our imagery and a lot of the river forecasting um, stuff in addition to the river forecasting centers. Um, and also CDC, which is in Atlanta. We've had the opportunity to meet with them. And although we don't have the main role in a health emergency, uh, we're definitely a supporting role when we work with them um, in that. Um, but I'm also a meteorologist, like I mentioned, so I'm very fortunate that our Leadership in Region 4 recognizes that and utilizes me as a meteorologist as well. Um, I think that my science background in meteorology is so valuable in GIS because the majority of the data that we work with every day is weather data and we are getting from NOAA or other agencies. Um, our region is unique. My boss, the GIS coordinator, is also the hurricane program manager and he is also a meteorologist as well. Um, we have another meteorologist, Mike Lowry, who many of you may recognize his name. Um, he sits in planning too. And then a, a regular staff meteorologist. And we're the only region that has a meteorologist on staff um, at this time. So 75% of my role, and I say 75 because I also deploy, like Victor said, falls into preparedness and response. So I sit under planning, but we also have a big role in response as well. So the operational planning branch. what? is preparedness or planning and what do they do? Uh, we have all different types of planners, deliberate, strategic, future planners. They all sit underneath operational, the operational planning branch and their role is to write and continuously revise all kinds of plans. So earthquake plans, we just did a complete rewrite of the New Madrid Seismic Zone plan. These are all catastrophic plans, gets into pretty detailed information and we work with our states to write these plans so that we have their input as well. Um, and we can utilize it if we ever need to. Uh, we're rewriting the hurricane plan right now, and we're also rewriting the all hazards plan. So planning, strategic planning is kind of an overall guidance. It happens at our headquarters level, um, but it has to encompass the broader aspects of emergency managing. Emergency management, we sit in the operational planning, and then our local agencies really do the tactical planning. They have the super specific numbers. You know, we're ingesting those, but they have different ways to track, um, to track numbers when it comes to that. Um, so like I said, these plans involve real numbers linked to catastrophic scenarios, and it allows us to figure out the hard questions and some bumps that we may come along before the disaster actually occurs. So not only do we write these plans, we also train people on these plans. We have national level, level exercises very frequently where we work through the plan and we have a scenario that is pretty realistic um, and we go through every level of response so that we can work out the kinks before a disaster might happen. So hurricane response, here's a nice graphic. Sorry it hasn't been updated since 2017, but uh, these are landfalling hurricanes for the continental United States. So as you can see, a lot in Region 4. A lot in Louisiana and Texas as well, but a lot in Region 4. Um, so for the, the remainder of my talk, I'm going to talk about hurricanes and how Region 4 responds to hurricanes. Um, this has been a really hot topic in our region. We've had um, three really, really busy seasons um, in terms of hurricanes. So we're just missing Michael and Florence on this map. So the Hurricane Liaison Team. At, at FEMA, we have a group of really talented people. Uh, their mission is a little different from FEMA's mission, but the, the major part of their mission is to improve the nation's capability to respond to hurricanes through rapid exchange of critical information. So I like to highlight critical information. It's all about information sharing here. So uh, the HLT, um, it was originated in 1995 hurricane season where there was an increase in requests from state and local governments for timely information directly from the National Hurricane Center and a need for the emergency management community be, to be kept up to date on the growth and movement of these storms. Um, it's made up of not only us at the federal level, but also at the state level and local emergency management. Uh, the director of the Hurricane Center um, requests one of our HLT members to deploy down to the National Hurricane Center during a hurricane response so that we have even more of a connection between the region um, and the National Hurricane Center. 
Um, and they essentially just function as a bridge between the scientists, the meteorologists, and the emergency managers and, and make sure that that immediate and critical information is, is communicated well and in a way that our leadership can understand. Uh, one thing that I did want to highlight, because uh, this is often misunderstood, is that it is the state and local officials that make evacuation calls during a disaster, though. It has nothing to do with the HLT. So we always defer to the state and local officials when we talk about evacuations. So just a little more about the responsibilities. Um, and then I also included, oh, on the last slide, this quote that we have on our mugs now. It's a highly dynamic situation that requires constant monitoring. And we find ourselves saying that to our leadership again and again when we're waiting for the next advisory to come out so that we can then communicate to them. Like um, so a little more on the hurricane liaison team. Again, just reinforcing decisions um, that our leadership is making. If we have an additional question of the National Hurricane Center, we can always go back and ask them. Now, during a hurricane response, we have three liaisons down. And the hurricane center is not that big, so three people down there is, is a big deal. Um, and also uh, relay this. I know that this was the theme of the AMS National Conference um, last year was communication and how we can be better about communication. And that is also a huge topic in emergency management as well because uh, we want consistent messaging all the way down to our city officials, all the way up to our headquarters up in DC as well. OK, so another big role of the hurricane liaison team is to conduct these hurricane evacuation studies. Um, and these are really in-depth studies um, that look at some hard questions that we need to answer when a hurricane is about to hit our region. Um, so they incorporate hazard analysis, what will be wet and what stays dry, a vulnerability analysis, which takes a deeper look at the demographics of the area being hit um, so that we can anticipate needs of those demographics. Uh, behavior analysis, what's the public thinking? How do people respond to an evacuation order? Um, what's going to make them go and what's going to make them stay? Um, so pets is a huge one that we've been um, trying to come up with a solution. There are only a few shelters that accept pets, and oftentimes people don't want to leave their pets behind, and that will make them stay even though they've been told to evacuate. Uh, shelter analysis, who needs shelters? Do we need more animal shelters? Um, and how we navigate all that. And then transportation analysis, too, because um, the road situation can get very, very busy when you're trying to move a lot of people at the same time. OK, so this, this gets a little more complicated. But in order to understand how FEMA um, makes or assists emergency managers in creating evacuation zones, you need a little background on slosh modeling. Um, so we piggyback off of the scientific storm surge model expertise of the Hurricane Center and use SLOSH, which stands for Sea, Lake, and Overland Surge from Hurricanes. So we're talking about water that hurricanes are bringing. Um, so all of the basin updates for this model are actually paid for by FEMA. That's how important it is to us. Uh, they're accurate and readily available. Um, and there's coverage for all of the US coastlines uh, that are vulnerable to hurricane surge. So um, the potential water that could come with a hurricane, what the Hurricane Center does is it runs this model several thousand times with hypothetical hurricanes under several different storm conditions. So anything that you can imagine, any forward speed, any direction, and any tidal level too, which that one's a little easier. It's either high or low. Um, but they run this a thousand times. Um, and those are called your meows, your maximum envelope of water that's going to come onto the land. Uh, like I said, it's user, de it's user dependent, so you can pick the forward trajectory speed um, and the direction too. So you're modeling a, a hurricane strike. Um, they then take those meows and combine them into the maximum of the meows, which is called the moms. Um, and the mom considers a combination of all of the directions, forward speeds, and tidal levels. And all that you pick from the moms is just the category of the storm. So no single hurricane will ever produce the regional flooding um, depicted in a MOMS. Um, but instead, that's intended to capture the worst case, highest water scenario for a particular hurricane. Um, and that goes uh, into evacuation planning as well, because the MOMS are what emergency managers use to develop the nation's evacuation zones. So here's an example. On the left, um, this is an output from the MOMS model. Um, which is a combination of all of the meows. Um, that's then broken up, and um, from there, evacuation zones are, f are formed. And that helps emergency managers 
make a better decision about if a category two storm is coming, this zone needs to go. And so they can combine all of these uh, models and depict zones. Um, here's a little more advanced one from New York City. You can see that they're using um, different directions and categories as well to break up their evacuation zones. And then what that helps them do is then further analyze their zones and say, okay, there's about uh, 370,000 people in zone one. If we call zone one by itself, that's how many people are leaving. Or you combine the two zones and you get the number of people that you're expected to move um, at one time. So building these zones, um, the Hurricane Center has an excellent class that um, they educate all of our local emergency managers on how to do this. Um, but you'll use the slosh modeling, like I said, but it's not as easy as that because it's hard to communicate to people uh, what zone they're in, right? So they try and use natural boundaries. Like if I were to say to you, if you're south of I-88, you can stay. But if you're north of 88, you need to evacuate. So they try and use interstates or things uh, that are really known to the locals, which is why the local EMs make these decisions, not us, um, so they can clearly communicate to the citizens wh um, when they need to go. Okay, so like I kind of alluded to, FEMA has a, a tool that helps local emergency managers figure this out. Um, so it was called HERVAC. Um, HERVAC, which is simply short for hurricane evacuation, is a storm tracking decision support tool uh, that the National Hurricane Program um, came up with that's administered by FEMA in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers and NOAA as well. Um, but this program combines uh, the live feeds of tropical cyclone forecast information. So all of the advisories that the National Hurricane Center is putting out um, are, are within this program. And then it also takes data from these hurricane evacuation studies as well and incorporates that all together. Uh, the program Access is restricted to official government emergency management, um, but it dates back to a program called DECIDE, if anyone has ever heard of this, um, and it was formulated by an NWS employee in Charleston, South Carolina, after Hurricane Hugo. So right now, HERVAC is going through a really exciting update. It's being rebranded as HVX, um, which we just started training on last year. And so I was able to go down to the course at the Hurricane Center and sit with emergency managers as they use the new HVX tool. So some of the similarities, you still get that graphical forecast information and the text products that come out of the National uh, Hurricane Center. Um, it has this excellent tool that you can um, make clearance time graphics. So it, it has demographic information embedded in it and uh, building stock data embedded in it so that um, it will tell you how long it'll take for that zone that you've created within the program to evacuate to a safer place. Um, you can also create reports uh, for wind timing, evacuation timing, like I just said, and a storm summary report. So this is excellent for our local emergency managers to then relay to their government officials, maybe the mayor or uh, the governor of the state. Um, the key difference is HVX is now completely web-based, and I'll show you some screenshots uh, on the next um, on the next slide here, uh, there's a really awesome training module, uh, which I'll show you, that's based off of the FEMA Hurricane Liaison Team members, too, so that's kind of fun. Uh, but I think the coolest part about it is that you can interact with the slosh display in a way that you never could before. So before, Noah had this really old slosh viewer that was a desktop application and a pain to update, and this has made it uh, so much easier. So this is what the web-based tool looks like. Um, like I said, you can view all storm information. The advisories come in here sometimes faster than I think they update on the website when you are refreshing the National Hurricane Center website. Um, but the cool thing is that it also has all historic hurricanes too. So you can go back and uh, see how a hurricane affected an area and, and move through all the advisories from um, a historic hurricane as well. Um, like I mentioned, you also have all the slosh modeling here, so you can pick um, whatever direction you want, whatever category, whatever forward speed, and whatever title level, um, and it'll mix it based on what you pick. And the cool thing is, is that before you could only pick one direction, and you were married to that one direction. Now we can uh, do something that we like to call the meow mixer, and you can pick whatever uh, directions that you want and kind of get something that puts you in between the meow and, it, and the moms, right? Like you know it's going to come from the north, but not exactly, sorry, moving towards the north, but not exactly, uh, not exactly 
what particular direction. So you can plan for catastrophic, but not as catastrophic as the, meow, as the mom scenario might be. Um, so that's the slosh display, a couple examples. And then here's, uh, that's actually my boss, that's his little bitmoji at the corner there. Um, and these tutorials will take you all the way through uh, this online version of, of Hervac, now rebranded as HVX. And really, um, it's a really powerful tool. So we're excited that this is happening as well. Um, so another tool uh, that FEMA planners particularly will use is FEMA's Coastal Flood Loss Atlas. And uh, the goal with the Coastal Flood Loss Atlas was essentially to create a dictionary of possible coastal flooding conditions um, pre and post hurricane landfall. Um, so the CFLA uses HAZIS, and HAZIS is a geographic information-based uh, natural hazard tool that is free and distributed by FEMA. Um, and HAZIS is used for estimating potential losses, not just from hurricanes, but also from earthquakes and floods as well. Um, so like I said, it uses GIS, and it can estimate physical, economic, and social impacts um, of a disaster. Uh, it's packaged with data sets that include building inventories, um, as well as infrastructure data for the entire United States. So it uses that data then to model the impacts of a disaster. So the Coastal Flood Last Atlas is a county by county um, detailed maximum of, um, of flooding. And you can get the county by county estimates of loss, it helps you visualize storm, uh, storm flooding and um, gives you a bunch of outputs like this, like shelter needs, debris totals and tons or truckloads, economic loss, per capita loss, uh, maximum water depth. Um, some that we use a lot is estimated days of, that hospitals are gonna be inoperable. I know that's, that's a big one that we, we make reports on all the time. Here is a, a mapping output from Hazus. Um, you can see the building loss ratio for different counties in North Carolina. And the flood loss atlas is built off of the moms completely. So you're, you're getting your worst case scenario, but you still get to go in there and pick the category of storm that you're anticipating and get outputs very quickly on what the damage is going to look like. Um, it's also on ArcGIS Online, um, which we're really excited about because it's forward facing, public facing. You just go to FEMA's Geo platform and you can uh, find all of the CFLA information here and click through different categories and all of the different um, outputs that has us. We've already run all of the runs for all the moms. Um, so it's all right here in our um, Coastal Fall Loss Atlas Online. Uh, this is a different tool. Uh, no matter how much we push people towards online mapping, they still want static maps. So this is a good example of a static map that we did. Um, this was an anticipation of Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Irma looked like it was going to be a big strike to Miami for a few advisories. And so we took the Category 4 and the Category 5 mom scenario and did a complete demographic run on the area that was touched by water. Um, so as you can see, there are a lot of really important things on here. Um, like I said, Miami-Dade County, you have all of your counts for infrastructure. So any critical infrastructure, airports, hospitals, um, daycares, anything um, that we've deemed critical. And this was actually created in a map book. So although I'm just showing you Miami-Dade County, this output was every single county that was touched by a surge during a mom's output for category four or five storm. So you had a county profile, which is really helpful to our folks who deploy ahead of a storm because they're oftentimes going into counties that they don't necessarily know anything about. So this is a quick reference guide to um, what is in that county, what they can anticipate in terms of uh, disaster response as well. Um, so, and, and it does include some of the hazards run stuff here. So you can see um, residential buildings, you can see hospital beds. Um, and then there was a new measure that we included uh, two years ago that we are still perfecting, but uh, you see IA, PDA, affected, minor, and major. And this has to do with our recovery um, potential damage assessments. And so now we can predict how many households or applicants for individual assistance are going to fall within the minor category or the major category. So again, it gives us a better um, snapshot of what recovery will look like after a hurricane. This is really cool. We've done this a couple of times, but um, this is... Um, using Hazus to overlay the, stir, uh, the surge for a Category 5 um, hurricane in Miami, Florida. And so this is just using Google Earth. It's just the regular building inventory that Google Earth has. But 
as we speak to all of our states, we reiterate again and again that if your building inventory data set is more robust, we can do more things with this model. And, and we're hoping that one day with a robust building inventory from every state, we can really start to nail down uh, what the damage is going to look like from a hurricane. Okay, so this is again what I talked about, the potential damage assessments. So this is just an output of Hazus. You can see for that particular county, it gives you a number for minor, um, for minor damages there and then major damages for each category of the hurricane. So like I said, this is pre, this is planning, this is a planning product. So this is done well before a disaster happens. So our planners already have this in their hands when they have a hurricane coming towards them and, and it can give them a lot of answers um, with little work on our app. Okay, so switching over to our response center. So everything I was talking about before is planning. This is stuff that we do in blue sky days, um, not when a disaster is about to occur. Uh, when a disaster is about to occur, um, we, um, we activate our regional response coordination center. And here, so here's a picture of region four is um, RRCC as we call it. Uh, the purpose of the RRCC is to coordinate multi-agency regional response and recovery efforts as a disaster occurs or unfolds. Um, we deploy and track several federal assets before a storm in support of disaster operations. And we also convey um, from our states to our regional level, then to our headquarters level, um, just situational awareness and what's happening. Uh, the headquarters level also stands up their own version. It's the NRCC, the National Region, or sorry, the National Response Center. Um, and this is all in support of us developing a common operating picture, and, and that's to ensure that situational awareness is maintained at all times. Um, so you can see the different levels of activation. Um, we usually don't jump straight to a level one activation. That would only happen if a major earthquake were to happen. Um, but instead, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a timeline here soon, but instead um, we start by maybe doing an enhanced watch and have kind of a skeleton crew watching what's going on and starting to talk to our states. Um, and then we increase our level as the incident gets closer, especially for a hurricane. Um, I don't know that we've ever gone to a level one. We usually only go to a level one for a major hurricane. So we did go to level one last year for Michael. Um, just a little bit about what goes on in the RCC. So it's not only FEMA employees that we have now in the RCC, which we have about 130 FEMA employees in our region, but then we start to bring in these emergency support functions as well. And so for level one activation, that's kind of the difference between the levels, whether or not we call in these emergency support functions. So just to call out a couple of these, transportation, that's huge for the hurricane evacuation um, process that we go through. Um, communications, we work a lot with um, search and rescue on the mapping side as well. Um, to kind of help them assign different um, areas that they need to go to and, and areas of interest as well. Um, energy, uh, we're always very concerned about power restoration and when power restoration is going to happen. And that seems like it should be a pretty easy ordeal, although in some of our states like South Carolina, we have a lot of co-ops um, that don't report their data. Um, so it could be completely black in a few counties and, and we have uh, a, no report of that. So we rely on our state um, partners to tell us that information who are hopefully getting those from the co-ops as well. Um, and then external affairs is another big one as well. Um, what are people saying? Are, are they saying, oh, there's 100 people trapped here or you know, no one can evacuate from this spot. So they constantly, we have a whole emergency support function dedicated to monitoring um, social media and, and stuff like that. Um, so a little bit about our organization. Um, so we are under a regional administrator. Head, our headquarters level has an, a politically appointed administrator. Our regional administrator, which is not true in all regions, is not a political appointee, which means that we get to keep her all the time. Um, so the RCC is organized underneath the regional administrator, then there's a chief of the RCC. And then we go into these four different sections, situational awareness, planning support, resources, and support to the actual RCC. And so our goal is all the same. Um, it's to support the incident, collect, analyze, and share information as the incident unfolds. So GIS falls under the situational awareness section, um, which is really the um, incident information hub for everything that's going on in the RCC, as well as everything that's going on as our states elevate their activation levels as well. 
Um, so you can see there's also a, docu a documentation unit, an information collection unit, and an analysis unit as well. And so they're doing um, any kind of analysis that actually doesn't require geospatial and mapping um, that they kind of take care of there. So uh, five to seven days out, like I said, we start to activate our enhanced watch uh, support. And the enhanced watch is a 24-7 unit. We have watch officers that sit in our office, uh, two of them overnight at all times. So we're always ready to respond. So enhanced watch is just simply supplementing them and bringing more people onto our staff um, to respond to a bigger disaster. Um, we establish a joint information center, which is oftentimes downrange. So we have two regional um, IMAT teams that can deploy at any time, as well as we have national level IMAT teams. And these people, their, their main role is to go out to the disaster area. And so oftentimes the Joint Information Center is actually the state emergency operations center. So we're sitting right with the state um, as a disaster is unfolding. Um, the Hurricane Liaison Team member will deploy to the National Hurricane Center, uh, like I previously said. Um, and then all FEMA employees will get an alert um, that we are going to an activation. And so it'll call people back. Um, and we have a system that does all of that. Um, and then we start to conduct our, conduct our um, coordination calls with state partners. So they have a big level call where our regional administrator talks to the director of the states. But then we also have uh, smaller calls going on where we reach out to our state GIS counterpart um, and make sure that we have a seamless, a seamless flow of information on the geographic side. Um, if they're updating something, we want to know. And so this makes sure that we're on the same page from the GIS side as well. Uh, three to four days before the storm, we'll activate to level three. We will deploy a state liaison to the state EOC. So although the IMAT team may already be there, we have designated um, liaisons between all of our states. Uh, we start conducting the modeling. Um, at three to five days out, we're still using the MOMS. Um, there's still so much uncertainty in the track uh, that we can't really hone in on it too much yet. Um, so we use the moms to try and plan uh, for resources that might be needed. Um, we um, activate our regional evacuation coordination unit. So that's just in support of the state. Um, all of our states are different. I'm trying, I'm trying to think. In I know in Texas, it's up to, um, I think, the district coordinator. It's up to different people depending where you are. Like in most of our states, it's up to the governor when an evacuation is called. And then some of our states differ in whether or not there's a mandatory evacuation and they can demand that you leave, or if it's a voluntary evacuation, or if it's a suggestion. Um, there's no universal uh, way that our states do it, because they all want to do it differently. Um, we start to identify uh, federal staging areas. Um, and we start to actually deploy commodities, such as uh, water and food, um, to an area where we know it will not be impacted. And um, I, I'm just, I'm, I think this is kind of an interesting story. We had a kind of rush mission during Hurricane Florence to deploy some resources. There's a section of South Carolina near Myrtle Beach that if all the rivers flood, it's cut off from the rest of South Carolina. And so we're watching these river gauges rise and rise and knowing that these bridges are going to be cut off. And so there's a peninsula of Myrtle Beach that will be cut off. And so we all of a sudden get this rush mission to say, where can we land these commodities and then also store them in a gravel area that is X amount of square miles, right? And so, um, I mean, we, all, we obviously asked the state if they had that kind of information. But sometimes it comes down to us looking at imagery and saying, this looks like it's an OK place. Why don't you ask the state about this? Or here's an Air Force base. Why don't we try there? Um, so that's stuff that's happening uh, pre the disaster. So I wanted to highlight the Hurricane Incident Map Journal, which is a new thing that we really, really showcase um, this hurricane season. Um, so this is the one that we made for Hurricane Florence. Uh, so an, a map journal is a GIS product that is online. Um, and it can ingest different services from anywhere. So if someone is serving a shelter layer and it has a shelter status, we can put that into our map journal. So um, here's Hurricane Florence. Um, on our cover page, we just had really simple um, things such as warnings, current radar, um, and the river, river status here. Um, transportation, we incorporated live feeds from Waze this year. 
as well as the evacuation routes and traffic incidents reported along those routes too. So our state was feeding us a lot of that information. Most states have traffic cams along the evacuation routes and so we can bring in those live feeds too to see the actual progress of an evacuation and, and how it's going so that we can respond to um, problems that may arise along the way. I, something interesting, this is South Carolina, and when I, when I talk about evacuations, so South Carolina is one of, I actually used to be the GIS specialist for the South Carolina Emergency Management Agency, so South Carolina has an interesting evacuation problem where they actually have the longest timeline to evacuate their coast, which means that they need to make a decision about evacuations almost four days before um, the onset of tropical storm force winds. So, if anyone has ever watched hurricane tracks, they change a lot, especially in four days. Um, so the governor has a really difficult um, choice here in terms of evacuations because their timeline is just so long. And the reason that their timeline is, wrong, is, is long is because they're not gonna send people up into North Carolina because if a hurricane is affecting South Carolina, it's probably also affecting North Carolina. And same with Georgia. They're not, so their only way out is to send people up 26 here. And so what South Carolina does during their evacuation process is they actually uh, do contraflow on I-26, which means all lanes are going uh, to the northwest and, and away from the coast. And so that's a huge operation that they, uh, they exercise again and again so that when they do need to pull a full evacuation, um, they can do it. And they actually did pull a full coastal evacuation two years ago. And, um, Everything went smoothly. Um, here's another product that we, that just this year we put into our map journal, which was a huge success for us. This is the force laid on map, and it's pretty much where all of our commodities and resources are. So not just things, but also people. Um, and this used to be a, uh, you know, Mary would run over here and tell this person that this is here, and someone was in charge of collecting all of that information, and then we would make a static map that the minute it was printed, it was old, and so. Uh, to have this in the hurricane incident journal like this was a huge success for us during hurricane season this year. Um, and not only that, but then we also have a GIS person uh, embedded in the national IMAT teams too, which means that all that they need to do to get this information is pull up this mapping product and they can incorporate it in, into anything that they're making as well. And then this is one that, um, from my perspective, is so simple, but the Weather Prediction Center is putting out these uh, QPFs, these quantitative precipitation forecasts, and Everyone wanted to see that overlaid with the river status, um, where the rivers were right now, how much more additional rain are they going to get, and, and what areas do we really need to focus on. And so overlaying it in a map journal like this was such a success because, as, again, as soon as we printed that map for someone, it was old because they update these services constantly and they're constantly monitoring the rivers and constantly changing that precipitation forecast as well. So people really loved this this year as well. Um, and then shelter status, and this is a good example of, um, these were two web services, ArcGIS Online web services that we were getting from our state partners. And so in their uh, emergency operations center, they have people sitting there inputting information from their counties about where they're opening shelters, what the status of the shelters are, um, if they're full, um, their hours, and if they allow pets, and a lot of information like that. And so uh, we were able to create a service out of that and give a complete picture of the shelter status for, um, for Hurricane Florence. Um, another unique thing about shelters in particular is this year we had the opportunity to work with the National Water Center um, and their modeling team and their water model. Uh, we had several water models that we were uh, analyzing during Hurricane Florence because it's a um, drop of 20 plus inches of rain in our states. Uh, but the National Water Center, we, um, sent them our shelter layer and said, can you tell us if any of these shelters are at risk of flooding? And they were able to give us back a product um, that said, yes, in or out, um, as simple as that, and that was really helpful. So uh, we hope we can keep working with them in the future in their operational center. And then like I mentioned before, uh, this is just a nice place where all the crowdsourced uh, photos come together. Um, and so our external affairs loves this. Um, Anyone that has a geographic tag to an image, um, you'll see it in here, and you can see uh, where a lot of the damage um, was going on during Hurricane Florence. Uh, so one to two days before the storm, um, this is when we will activate to level two or level one, depending on uh, the category of the storm that's headed towards us. 
Um, we have all of our resources in place. Uh, 24 hours before, we're not really moving many resources anymore. Uh, we're just kind of making sure that our personnel and resources are in safe places um, and, and getting ready for landfall as well. Um, and another interesting thing is this is where, um, this is actually where a first hurricane watch, watch is issued and where the National Hurricane Center starts issuing a product called the Potential Storm Surge, which is, uh, I think it's been two or three years that they've been um, issuing this. And what that is, is they've now taken the slosh modeling and the meows and they've made it storm specific to the, to the hurricane that is about to um, impact our states. And so this is a product that comes out with every hurricane advisory um, and it comes in a GIS format where we can easily download it. Um, and uh, we were making a lot of anal analysis maps and infrastructure maps and telling our leadership what was within that surge on the fly. And that product was changing as each advisory came out. So I actually have a talk about this at the National AMS conference. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, I have a lot more to say on that. That was kind of my, my project. Um, 24 hours. So, so what that storm surge product does is it really, that last run before landfall gives us a picture of what otherwise is kind of a gray area in emergency management where the hurricane has made landfall, but what were the impacts? And so that storm surge product at least gives us, this is how many people experience this much water. Um, so then jumping to 24 hours post storm, um, we immediately start to establish our preliminary damage assessments. These are done in conjunction with the state. Um, oftentimes the state has a, a GIS online product that helps with these preliminary damage assessments. And so what they will do is they'll go door to door, assess the damage, take pictures, and it'll all start populating on this online um, GIS product. Um, start to push more commodities as they're needed. We establish an air operations branch. Immediately we start to get imagery um, and, and start to analyze change detection between uh, what was dry before and what is now wet uh, so that we can have a better uh, look at what the inundation was. Um, we manage deployment of national assets through our regional response center and we develop a prioritized remote imagery um, mission assignment. So we're telling um, the people who are flying exactly where to go, what areas we're concerned about um, and what areas we think were hit the hardest. So uh, this is a declaration map. Um, Oftentimes, especially with disasters that we've had recently, we'll have a pre-disaster uh, pre declaration request, which means that the government releases funds to these states before landfall. And so you, there's a few criteria to meet in order to get that, um, but these hurricanes certainly met that criteria. So the different colors are just whether the county qualified for individual assistance, which would be um, you applying for damage to your home, or public assistance, which is a company applying for assistance um, after disaster. Um, so the process to get a declaration in is um, the locals have to prove, for lack of better terms, that the damage exceeded their capabilities to respond. Um, and then furthermore, the state says, yes, we met these thresholds. Uh, the governor signs a request for a declaration. Um, it goes through our regional office. We sign it and it goes to the president um, for him to sign to declare a presidential disaster declaration. Um, so again, 48 hours afterwards, here's an example of some of the imagery that NOAA did for us on the coast. Um, we start to determine where our joint field office locations might be and this is where we intend to be with the state for possibly years after a major disaster and work in conjunction with the state so that our recovery division director is with their same recovery division director and we're all on the same page as we move forward with, with recovery. Um, we continue to conduct post impact analysis. This is something that's, that's really hard. Um, we have imagery to work with. Uh, we have USGS going out there, taking high water marks, trying to tell us how high the water actually got in certain places, but we still have a lot of gaps in what actually happened. And, and um, you know, we want to answer it without boots on the ground because oftentimes having people there is hazardous after a disaster as well. And then 72 hours post storm. So um, this was an interesting graphic that is zoomed in for some reason that we made um, after Hurricane Michael and we were able to use their building inventory and we knew after a certain date 
that they had better building codes in that area. And so we were able to overlay the wind analysis with those with that building inventory and give an estimate of how many structures were built before the building codes or after the building codes and, and what would still be standing. And, and this ended up being a great product because when you looked at the imagery, you could pick out the houses that were built to code and that they actually stood up during, um, during Hurricane Michael. Uh, so we finalized the joint field office build out. This is typically when our regional employees will start to deploy. Um, to the joint field office, which, like I said, is close to wherever the state EOC is typically because they're also uh, moving into the joint field office with us. Um, and then 72 hours post, uh, post short-term recovery. So um, we start to develop our actions for long-term recovery. So what, it, what is going to take a really long time? We have a period where individuals can apply for assistance, a period where public uh, companies can apply for assistance. and. Uh, from a GIS perspective, we'll start to monitor where those applications are coming from and, um, and make sure that our disaster survival assistance teams are knocking on every single door um, to let people know that you can apply for assistance through FEMA. And so we do that in a really neat way through mapping where um, if they've knocked on a door, they drop a point on a map and say, um, no response, left a flyer, or talked with the individual, and that gives our recovery team a great picture of where they need to go. They can overlay that with the hardest hit areas that are determined from the post-storm impacts um, and see who they've reached and who they haven't reached. So that's a really powerful tool in recovery. And that's actually all I have. <laughs> Hi there. I had a, a question with, uh, do you, does your model calculate um, the amount of truckloads that you need to use when you do disaster, disaster recovery? Because uh, I, I work in the transportation industry we, uh, with, a tr with a brokerage company, and sometimes when it comes to um, our carriers based in certain regions, especially this year with Michael and Florence, uh, we actually had some say, no, we can't do any business with you guys this week. We're actually being used by with FEMA to start recovery operations, and then we can't use them for a full week. So I was just curious, uh, does your model actually calculate the truckloads that you guys need yeah, to use? Yeah, so the HAZUS model has an output that estimates, based on the category of the storm, not only uh, truck debris and truckloads, but also debris and tons. So yeah, that's probably why that's happening. So uh, as I recall, Hurricane Harvey got so bad because of the unporous um, land um, is there any way that you could use these maps to try to encourage, like, Houston to not build anymore? Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question, and that's a, a side of FEMA that I didn't even talk about. So we have a mitigation division uh, within FEMA, and that's all that mitigation does is they do federal buyouts from properties that have shown repetitive loss, which GIS gets involved in that. Um, just in Hurricane Florence, we are actually looking at and this is strange, but we are looking at places that the federal government has acquired, that FEMA has acquired after disaster, because they've said, you've applied for assistance here more than once, and we don't think that you should live here anymore. So they do a buyout. Um, and so it, during Hurricane Florence, they were looking at North Carolina's building inventory and looking at um, land that the federal government has acquired and kind of cross-referencing that and trying to see if there, in fact, were buildings on land that the federal government has acquired. Um, and, and so, I mean, it's, they'll do buyouts, they'll do um, mitigation projects, um, such as uh, in New Orleans with the levees, they tried to mitigate that, um, and, and just several things. So once a disaster declaration is declared, the entire state is eligible for um, hazard mitigation assistance. And so it doesn't have to just be the counties that were affected. It could be any projects that the state wants to do within, um, within their state boundaries that they think would prevent um, from being a bigger disaster if something were to happen again. Um, I kind of lost track in there which ones. It sounded like some were publicly available and yeah. others are not. So HERAVAC is not publicly available. It's a government-only tool. It's funded by us and um, the Army Corps of Engineers. However, HAZUS is publicly available. That's our uh, loss estimation tool. And it actually plugs directly into um, our map right now. Um, so that's actually going under a revision, and they hope to bring it completely to a web-based um, product as well because they're having 
a problem keeping up with how frequently Esri updates their ArcMap versions. Um, but as of right now, if you're still on the last version of ArcGIS, um, you can run Hazus in congruence with that. And there are several tutorials. There are free online classes on um, Esri's website online that you can take that will walk you through how to do Hazus runs, what your inputs need to be, and understanding the output too. So that one is publicly facing, and so is the Coastal Flood Loss Atlas, which all that FEMA's done with the Coastal Flood Loss Atlas is done those hazardous runs for you for all of the categories of the hurricanes, and we already have the output in a nice, friendly place for you guys to view. I was just wondering and curious about how you kind of find this balance between keeping people safe but also avoiding sensationalism. I'm from New Orleans. I grew up there, and I kind of know like what it's like with people and hurricanes and their response to it, and also plays into what, how you feel about the media's role and distributing the emergency information that you put out to a lot of the management that makes the decisions. Yeah, so um, I feel like at, in my state role at South Carolina, we interface a lot more with the county level, um, whereas FEMA is not asked to assist on until a state has needs that aren't met. Um, so we're a little farther removed from the situation, um, although we are still activated 24-7 during an activation. Um, New Orleans is not part of our jurisdiction, but um, I think that it's interesting, especially today, um, there are a lot of articles about our administrator and what went wrong and why he resigned and stuff like that, so we just try and stay away from <laughs> the bad publicity sometimes. Um, we have, like I said, we have um, external affairs people who monitor our social media constantly. I know uh, we've been kind of blasted before for not having sign language people on all of our messaging, and so uh, it, we're constantly learning and trying to improve how to, how to better get the message out there. Hi, I was curious, the uh, various models, slosh, QPF, and all, how well did those handle high-end precip events like the precipitation out of Harvey? Um, it, it actually, I think it, it did too well. I mean, everyone was looking at that and saying, there's no way that amount of water is going to fall. Um, but the, I, the QPF nailed it both for, I can't speak to Harvey as much as I can to Florence, but um, we knew for days ahead of time that a large amount of water, that the system was going to stall and a large amount of water um, was going to fall over North Carolina. And furthermore, not only did we know that a large amount of water was going to fall over North Carolina, but we knew that that was going to impact all of our rivers in South Carolina too. So we had to look even farther ahead. And if all this water falls in North Carolina, where is it gonna go? This is gonna be a big problem for South Carolina too. Katie, I have two quick ones for you. For the students sitting in the room, what sort of skills, maybe skill sets, do you wish you would have came out of undergrad or maybe sharpened up in grad school to get where you are now? Was it programming, is it GIS specifically or? Yeah, so I studied meteorology. I didn't take a GIS class until my senior year at Valpo. Um, and that's kind of what made me go to grad, graduate school because I didn't feel like I had enough GIS to really uh, hold a job in that field. And so I wanted to delay going to the real world and also um, learn some more about GIS too. So I think GIS is, is a really important skill to have in the emergency management world. I think that more and more programs have emergency management programs and so I can't speak to a academic emergency management program because I never went through one. But the, most of the people I work with never went through an emergency management program either. So. Um, Management skills are really good to have. Like, like that video said, we're managing disasters. So even if you're far removed from the meteorology, um, you could manage recovery. Um, you could manage some of those different programs in recovery as well. So, um, and then FEMA offers a lot of their courses just so that you know the incident management structure and how FEMA works online uh, for free as well. So. so my second question is, time and time again with these disasters, we see the same thing. We're fairly good at forecasting them, mm -hmm. but it's the behavioral science that always seems to get us. And I think one of your slides actually highlighted that towards the uh, beginning of your talk. How much research is there being done at FEMA in terms of messaging, um, you know, some of the evac models, right? Okay, so let's say we're telling people to evacuate in a mandatory zone. Do we have traffic flow models? 
what if everybody all of a sudden has a half a tank of gas and they're like, I'm going to the pump first right, to fill exactly. up, right? So uh, what sort of things is FEMA doing in terms of behavioral, social analysis? I don't think we're doing enough of that in the weather yeah. service specifically, but is FEMA doing anything in terms of... Yeah, so we have a whole... So we have a whole um, national preparedness section, which their focus is to um, educate the public on how to respond to disasters. So you'll hear, um, you should have a go kit. Here's what you should have in your go kit. And that's on, you can find a lot of that on ready.gov and, and, and stuff like that. Or if, if you're listening to the public messaging, like get gas now, stuff like that. Um, but in terms of actual science and studying evacuations, um, I know that South Carolina and a lot of the academic um, hazard labs do send out surveys to people who live in coastal areas and say, you know, uh, would you evacuate if this? You know, is it a problem? Can you not evacuate because you don't have car, right? And so South Carolina has a huge bus contract where they will bus people out of the coastal areas if for example, they live in Charleston and they walk everywhere and they don't have access to transportation. Um, and then on the flip side of that, it's a lot of people don't want to leave because they don't know where they're going or where are they going to stay. They don't have friends or family to stay with away from the coast. And so uh, we have contracts with hotels and housing and HUD it helps us uh, kind of figure that out. So I think that the messaging is, is really important um, because th there's two sides. There's either a fear of evacuating or there is this um, mindset that FEMA and most of the academics have found that, well, I survived Katrina, and nothing's going to be worse than that, so I'm going to stay for this storm. And so um, you're kind of fighting against that. I mean, it's the same thing in, in tornado world, where you overwarn people, then they're going to stop responding to it. And so um, that's why it's a big deal. Like when South Carolina pulls a full coastal evacuation, I think it was for Matthew. I'm, Sorry, I'm getting all my storms confused. They pulled a full coastal evacuation for Matthew, and South Carolina was not very affected by Hurricane Matthew, right? And, and South Carolina in particular has anyone who remembers Hurricane Hugo, like, well, they're fine because they survived Hurricane Hugo, so this is nothing. And, and some of that, um, it's a long-winded response, some of that has to do with how we categorize hurricanes, too, and how we sure. um, communicate the risk of a hurricane, too, because... Uh, water is obviously much more dangerous in some aspects. I mean, Hurricane Michael was all wind. It's like a tornado going through that area. So, so we have. To, I think. I think a reanalysis of how we are communicating risks and categorizing hurricanes is definitely something. So you can wait till the stream stops to answer this one. But how do you think the response was to Irma? And we can just cut it right there. To Irma? Yeah. Um, Irma. Ir Irma Maria. I what the. What's oh, so Maria, so Maria Maria's was in Puerto not Rico, region. Sorry. I did not deploy for Maria. So okay, I, can't Mar Mar I was thinking Maria, the one that hit Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that it's an infrastructure problem in Puerto Rico. Is my um, my personal opinion. I have several friends who deployed to Hurricane Maria, and I think that if FEMA was doing everything that they can. I mean, our employees were in condition, like staying in conditions that were very poor, just trying to help these people. I mean, we have a GIS person on our team who's part of Region 3 who actually lives in Puerto Rico full time. And we were staying at his house and that was not affected and, and stuff like that. And so some of the stories that um, my coworkers have from their response in Maria, I mean, they're, they're still down there. They're still a completely staffed joint field office down there trying to help them recover. All right. Let's thank Katie again. <laughs>